In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects. Tonight on primetime, the former officer who shot and killed Rayshard Brooks will not be let out on bond. We're hearing from his lawyer about the next steps for this case. A popular Atlanta neighborhood planning to close down its streets tonight after a string of crimes. Residents say they're tired of waiting for help. And celebrating an end to slavery, thousands gather in Atlanta to recognize Juneteenth and to continue the push for equality. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. But first, dozens of Atlanta police officers calling out for the third straight day. The sick out or so-called blue flu beginning right after the Fulton County DA said that he was charging two officers in Rayshard Brooks's death. Many of you have reached out to us, urging us to find out how this sick out could affect 911 response times and overall safety in the city. Tonight, we are finally getting some answers from officers themselves. Tracy McPeer has more. I've never seen the morale so bad that it pushes a, the majority of an agency to do this. For enforcing the Vince Champion is the regional director of the International Brotherhood of Police Officers. And while he didn't know so many officers would call in sick since Wednesday, he's not surprised that it happened. And they want to do their job. They just don't want to do it in the city of Atlanta, where they're not respected and where they'll be, uh, you know, betrayed. The sick out started on Wednesday, immediately after District Attorney Paul Howard announced charges against the two police officers in the Rayshard Brooks shooting. Champion says the investigation by GBI, which is the lead investigating agency on this case, could take months, and there's no way for due process to happen so fast. They think, you know, that this, this could be me, and I could be doing my job, and next thing I know, I'm fired because the mayor doesn't like what she saw, and then I'm facing murder charges because the DA didn't like what he saw. During a virtual meeting with the city council today, interim police chief Rodney Bryant says so far, the sick outs have not put the city at risk. And while pending 911 calls have reached more than 30, they're usually low priority calls. And Bryant says that number is not far outside the norm. In this COVID period, and the call volumes are low, the number of sick outs does not have a dramatic effect on our response and our ability to address any given emergency that arises in the city. Bryant says for now they don't need outside assistance for 911 response. Champion says if they do ask, he's not sure how much help the city of Atlanta would get. Quite honestly, if I was a police chief or a sheriff of another county and I've got a DA that's charging officers with murder, to what appears to be them doing their job, I wouldn't send my officers there. For the last two days, our team has repeatedly asked to speak directly with the interim police chief and mayor about the sick outs to answer your questions and concerns about public safety. Once again today, we did not receive a response. Meanwhile, other police departments in Georgia are rolling out the welcome mat for any Atlanta officers who want to work somewhere else. 
We spoke to Coweta County Sheriff Len Wood today, and he told us they've already hired three former APD officers and have received several other applications already. They have 13 open positions currently. Sheriff Wood says his department is pulling all officers' personnel files and thoroughly vetting all candidates. He adds that any hires will have to go through a 12-week intensive training course before patrolling the streets there. The Forsyth County Sheriff's Office put out a call for applicants on social media. They appealed to officers in a Facebook post saying they would be valued by the department and would work in a community that strongly supports first responders. And the Henry County Police Department posted on their Facebook page yesterday that they have positions open as well. They listed the job along with the benefits, encouraging transfers to apply. Tonight, the officer charged with felony murder for killing Rayshard Brooks is sitting in jail after waiving his first appearance this afternoon. In court today, a Fulton County judge briefly discussed former officer Garrett Roth's case. Jill Henke was there. As Garrett Rolf said in jail, charged with the murder of Rayshard Brooks, his attorneys waived his first court appearance. But I will go ahead and announce that by virtue of the nature of the charges, uh, I am prohibited by law from setting a bond at this time. The felony murder charge Rolf is facing, stopping him from receiving bond today and keeping him behind bars. Meanwhile, Officer Devin Brosnan, facing lesser charges in the same case, received a bond Thursday and left jail shortly after turning himself in. The, the peacefulness that was happening, there was, there was no fighting, there was no scuffling. Maggie Kane and her friend Doran Hickey so today in a press conference recalled uh, being in the drive through line at Wendy's last Friday night and seeing Rayshard Brooks calmly talking with police before the deadly shooting. And hearing them shoot the tasers and then ultimately shoot shots in a situation where someone was running away while their own property was present uh, didn't make sense. Attorney Noah Pines, though acting as part of Rolf's legal team, sent 11 Alive this two-page statement today. He details Rolf attempting to arrest Brooks, and then Mr. Brooks began to struggle with and attack Officer Brosnan and Officer Rolf. Pines claims Brooks committed numerous felonies while attacking the officers, and when running away, he paused, reached back, pointed, and fired what we now know was Officer Brosnan's taser at Officer Rolf. Pines adds Rolf heard a sound like a gunshot and saw a flash in front of him. Rolf then shot Brooks. Hickey says he then watched the officer stand over Brooks. There was a long, lengthy discussion about that scene before there was any CPR. Rolf's attorney says the officer gathered himself and immediately called for EMS and began life-saving measures. 11 Alive has now learned that Garrett Rolf's stepmom has lost her job. Melissa Rolf's former employer is Equity Prime Mortgage. They said she violated company policy and other employees no longer felt comfortable engaging with her. They sent us a statement that reads in part, we value diversity of thought and respect Melissa's personal views and the views of all employees. However, when those views create a hostile working environment, we must make difficult decisions to part ways. The company did not elaborate on what she did or what she said to violate their policy. You can read more of the former Officer Rolf's attorney's statements on our 11alive.com website. We've got a full story for you there. You can also download our app to sign up for breaking news alerts about this case. Now to some other local stories making headlines today. Gwinnett police have arrested the man accused of killing three homeless people in Atlanta. 29-year-old David Lee was arrested this morning in the parking lot of the office depot on Holcomb Bridge Road. He is accused of killing Timothy Smith, Curtis Cockrell, and Maxine McDonald earlier this month in Atlanta. We are told the victims were found shot to death at three different locations dating back to June 1st. Jonesboro police are searching for a woman who shot and killed another woman outside the Waffle House on Terra Boulevard today. Police say the victim was waiting for an order in her car when another woman walked up and shot her. They say she then drove off in a white Buick Regal or Verano. The victim's name has not been released. And more problems for the DeKalb County Elections Office. They announced today that one of their elections workers has tested positive for COVID-19. They are now asking the Secretary of State's office to postpone certifying the county's results for the June 9th primary. They were supposed to be done by today. Elections officials say the temporary worker's first day was June 11th after the primary election. Hundreds of people celebrated Juneteenth today with the March at Centennial Olympic Park. Juneteenth is a significant day of celebration for black people in America. It marks the day in 1865 when it was announced in Galveston, Texas, that all slaves are free. 
and the importance of it is emphasized still today in 2020. We've seen some of the biggest marches for racial justice across Atlanta, the United States, and even the world. And even though this is a day of celebration, the marchers at today's one race rally delivered their message. There is still a long way to go. So it has taken quite a long time for Juneteenth to get this kind of widespread recognition. U.S. Senators just introduced a proposal to make it a national holiday. So we asked people who have been celebrating Juneteenth for a long time, what does it mean to you? Our viewer Al Miller sent us this. What Juneteenth means to me is it marked the end of silence in the midst of injustice. But now this day serves as a reminder that we have inequality, racism and injustice that still needs emancipation. Juneteenth is an American milestone that we all must use to continually abolish systematic racism and bridge the gaps that have oppressed us for far too long. And we want to know what Juneteenth means to you. Leave us a voicemail at the number right there on your screen. Your comments could be used in our shows. You know, Aisha, we've talked about this off the air a lot. My kids have learned a lot about this in school. I know that's not necessarily the case for all kids, but not just learning about it in school. I want them to hear Al's perspective and other people's perspective to really understand in a deeper way what this day means. And a lot of people are talking about it and, you know, really sharing personal stories of when did you first learn about Juneteenth? Because we're hearing so many people talk mm -hmm. about it this year, just in response to what's going on in the country. It's really been highlighted, but for a lot of communities, they grew up learning about this in their history classes, teachers who went off course a little bit if it wasn't a part of the curriculum and communities have been celebrating Juneteenth with parades and festivals for years. So I love that a new generation is seeing how mm -hmm. Juneteenth is done for a lot of people, Cheryl. And actually, some yeah, people absolutely. And even in the day, even even in coronavirus days, you know, it's like there have been some great celebrations, as you mentioned, in the city today. And there's a lot of them happening online as well, which has been cool to see too. I wanted to add that. And you guys can check that out. And we are glad to see people who went to those celebrations. Majority had on masks in the age of COVID-19. Some people might ask why we celebrate this day rather than the day the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. Leslie Foster explains. Open a U.S. history book and chances are its author will quickly point out January 1st, 1863. The date President Abraham Lincoln with one proclamation orders and declares that all persons held as slaves shall be free. What that same history book might fail to mention is what happened to these birds once they arrived on the shores of Galveston, Texas, more than two years after Lincoln wrote them. In the 1860s, word didn't travel like it did now. And in 1865, months after General Robert E. Lee's surrender, word of the end of the Civil War had yet to hit the Southern state and its quarter of a million slaves. And then came General Gordon Granger's arrival in Galveston, June 19, 1865. And General Order Number 3, all slaves are free. Juneteenth was born. While Juneteenth celebrations continued to varying degrees in the U.S. for decades, it would take until 1980 for Texas to become the first state to declare it a holiday. Today, 47 states recognize it and the District of Columbia, a chapter of our history for far too long left out of the books designed to document it, but no longer. Juneteenth, or as the National Museum of African American History and Culture now calls it, our country's second Independence Day. And we have a list of Juneteenth events on the 11 Alive app. It's not too late. You may be able to catch some celebrations uh, later this evening or even throughout the weekend. A Confederate monument taken down in Decatur overnight. Coming up, we're looking at which monuments could be next. Are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. 
on 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. One Confederate monument came down in Decatur today, and it may not be the last. A bill in the legislature targets a statue honoring Georgia in the U.S. Capitol. 11 Lies Doug Richards takes a closer look. The monument honoring the Confederacy has been a sore spot for years in central DeKalb County. County workers took it down overnight with the blessing of a DeKalb Superior Court judge and a late night crowd of buoyant spectators. Once the sun came up, the crowd reformed to bid the monument good riddance, led by DeKalb CEO Michael Thurmond. The statute is gone, but racism still remains. The monument removed overnight leaves behind dozens of other Confederate markers in Georgia, many of them at the state capitol. One Confederate figure honored with both a painting and a bust is the Confederacy's vice president, Alexander Stevens. Stevens also has a statue representing Georgia in the U.S. Capitol. He basically tried to use a scientific argument to say that the, the black race was inferior. Republican State Rep Scott Turner wants the Stevens statue in the U.S. Capitol taken down and replaced with a statue of Martin Luther King Jr. When it came to my uh, attention that this was a situation, it was a slam dunk no-brainer. Turner's resolution mimics other calls to remove vestiges of the Confederacy, from the granite face of Stone Mountain Park to the obelisk in Decatur. The Georgia legislature recently enacted a law to actually protect such monuments. Senator Jeff Mullis wrote it. The way I feel about monuments and memorials is that they should remain because it's part of our history. Good, bad, or indifference is part of our history. It's who we are. Turner's resolution to remove the statue of Stevens from the U.S. Capitol has bipartisan support. What it lacks is time. The legislature will adjourn in six working days. His resolution has not emerged as a priority. Well, your 11 Alive storm trackers have been busy tracking some strong storms this evening, and you can see how they've been rumbling. They moved through the North Georgia Mountains, across Lake Lanier, and now they are focused in on the East Metro, stretching over towards Athens, where we're seeing a lot of lightning right now from these storms. 14 strikes in the past 15 minutes alone and some very heavy rain associated with these storms as well as they scoot off to the east. You can see how they're moving rather briskly now up around 25 miles per hour to the southeast. And Linda Oswald, one of our 11 Alive storm trackers, reporting hail in Monroe. So we looked at that, and yes, indeed, there was some hail here near Wood Lake Boulevard, Boulevard uh, in Monroe, moving right along with those thunderstorms. So we're going to continue to track those this evening as they move off to the east. Otherwise, things are calming down, and some spots didn't get a single drop of rain, but boy, where they got the rain, it was heavy at times, and Gwinnett, you could see how the clouds were dark with moisture as we uh, moved through the late afternoon and evening hours, and then those storms ended up developing 
uh, into some pretty strong ones with those heavy downpours. 87 was our high today in Atlanta, 68 our low. We should be around 87 and 69, so we were very close to where we should be this time of year. And you can see where the rain-cooled air is now at 74 in Duluth, 71 in Gainesville, and then Blairsville. But we're still pretty warm down in LaGrange. We're at 84 degrees and 81 in Atlanta. So as far as what you can expect to see for the rest of night, those showers and storms are going to taper off. We'll have temperatures on the rise as we approach the first weekend of summer. And of course, the summer solstice, it is the longest day of the year. And we will have plenty of time to get out and enjoy the sunny warmth of the day. A 10 on our wasometer on our Saturday. And the only reason we're not an 11 is because it's going to be on the warm side and humid. So it's going to be quite hot out there. So you need to stay well hydrated and always remember to protect your skin and your eyes from the sun. So we're looking at those temperatures going up throughout the day tomorrow. Plenty of sunshine. Some of the models are hinting that we could try to see a shower or a storm, but I don't think it's going to be too likely. I think this is the main show we're seeing out there right now. Those storms are going to continue to move off to the east and die out overnight. So it looks like by the time we get to tomorrow morning, it'll be a nice start to the day. We'll end up seeing a few clouds building up during the day. Notice the models trying to pull in a stray shower or two, but we don't think we're going to see that. And on Sunday as well, I think high pressure is going to put uh, the pressure on anything that tries to pop up. And if we see anything, it won't last long. So a hot weekend. We're expecting to see our first 90 degree day this weekend. If we do, it'll be the first one of 2020. Uh, we're going to see the summer heat on the first day of summer and 91 degrees on Father's Day. And then a cold front moves through, takes our temperatures back down a few notches and brings in more rain. And we want to continue to talk about the history and importance of today, Juneteenth. We're going to be sharing some facts throughout prime time. Stick around for those. Here's one. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. It has been several weeks of upheaval here in Atlanta demonstrations, which turned violent one night following the death of George Floyd. Then the shooting of Rayshard Brooks 
in the parking lot of a Wendy's restaurant. Two officers have been charged. One, Garrett Rohl, faces a felony murder charge. Joining me right now is Chuck Todd, moderator of Meet the Press. And Chuck, now even though there has been a lot of discussions about policing and race relations for decades in our country, it just seems like we're at this turning point right now in America. As we look to November, when people get out there to vote, does the president's tweets of law and order and the protests that we're seeing right now, do we think that's going to carry over five months from now when we have the election in November? That's a that's an open question. I think if it does, uh, the president's in trouble. You know, one of the patterns we've noticed in his approval ratings or in any of his polling is that whenever he seems to be, uh, it, when we're in one of these uh, moments uh, on race in this country and he seems to insert himself in it or be a part of it, think Charlottesville, if you will, the both sides comments. Um, his numbers, that's one of the few times you see his numbers will, will plummet. Not a lot, but anywhere from three to five points. And if you look now, over the last month, as this has been so intense, um, and I think the focus where, where you now have a majority of white America seeing what majorities of, of what, what black America has been seeing for decades on the inequality front, is that you're seeing it take a toll on this president. So that's why I say if it does sustain itself, I think I, I don't think this law and order message of the president at all. I think it, it is a it is a message that is I don't think rings is is rings pretty hollow now. I mean, look, I I grew up in Miami in the 70s and 80s, and there was a lot of those messages and they would work at that time. Um, I don't it doesn't feel like that's a message that's going to resonate as well this cycle. Okay, you, you we're talking about President Trump now. He's heading to Tulsa for that rally tomorrow. And Chuck, uh, is this going to be the same kind of rally that we saw before the pandemic? So what are you looking for tomorrow night? That's the question I have. I mean, I know the president wants it to be right back to where it was. He wants one of those rallies, and, and his staff tells me that they he sort of, he needs this. It's, uh, you know, in the same way you and I were talking earlier about working from our homes for as long. In, in his mind, this is, he's been, he's been kempt up and he hasn't been able to have one of these moments. I, I will say this, I think he has expended an awful lot of political capital for a, to hold a rally in a city, um, uh, if, in a state that he really doesn't need politically, and if he does, he's in deep trouble nationally. He's expended a ton of political capital, and I don't know what the upside is other than to make him feel better. Um, it's caused a lot of strife within Oklahoma Republicans. You've got a city that's unhappy. You've got an African-American community in Tulsa who feels offended by how it was planned out mm -hmm. um, at first, the rally being on Juneteenth. It's come with nothing but sort of trouble uh, for, for this campaign. So I just think there's an awful lot of risk with this rally for what, I, what appears to me very limited upside. All right, turning out to a political story that's uh, rolling over right now in Georgia. And, and there's going to be a Republican runoff in the 14th Congressional District. Marjorie Taylor Greene was a top vote getter in the primary, but Politico uncovered some videos in which she made some negative comments about blacks, Jews, yeah. and Muslims. So how do national Republicans feel about her? And how worried are they if she wins this uh, very conservative seat? Well, I, I look, they've, they've already, the separation's begun. You've seen the unendorsements have come. You've had House leaders uh, try to endorse uh, the other gentleman in the runoff. I, I, look, this is one of those cases where if she's the nominee, um, kind of like if you recall the Congressman Steve King out in Iowa who had some, basically a, a self-proclaimed white nationalist, um, Republicans ended up ousting him in a primary, but he almost lost a very Republican seat two years ago because of those views. Uh, it it puts I, look. I think this is a, a potential disaster for the entire Republican ticket if she's on it in the fall. And the problem they have is is I think there's this nervousness if they come out and it looks like the establishment is like coming in droves trying to drive her out. I think there's some concern that the rank and file voter, particularly for a low turnout runoff you know, they might revolt against the quote-unquote establishment and she gets the nomination. And then you have all sorts of awkward... There are two competitive Senate races in this state. It's a competitive presidential race. I can tell you this. I know national Republican leaders would, would prefer her not to be on that November ticket. I just don't know how they stop her.
OK, I guess we just have to wait and see. Meet the Press air Sunday, 10 a.m. right here on 11 Alive. Chuck, as always, thank you, sir. Where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel. Where you Now to an 11 Alive exclusive investigation connected to COVID-19. We uncover some explosive claims against hospitals, a hospital accused of creating phony COVID-19 test results. Tonight, Reveal investigator Andy Parati follows up with the hospital about the accusations. Your job as a nurse is to be your patient's advocate. We are their only voice. A critical care facility accused of manipulating COVID-19 test results. The allegations made by four nurses in court documents filed against Landmark Hospital in Athens. One former and one current nurse agreed to tell us how the hospital allegedly does it. They've asked us not to identify them by face or name. When they had somebody that turned out positive, they would redo the test so that it would come back negative and they would say that it was a false positive. Once our testing the proper way started coming back positive, we then weren't allowed to collect the samples any longer. These nurses say the hospital instructed staff to take samples from inside someone's throat, but send them to a lab that only tests nasal swabs, knowing the results would turn out negative. When you raise red flags, what was their response? They would deny it. Mm -hmm. Deny, deny, deny. This nurse says when she properly administered a test, her boss retaliated. I did the test and 
it did turn out positive, so I was terminated for not having a doctor's order for a test. And this is multiple, multiple staff members that are raising flags. Natalie Woodward and Brian Cathy are attorneys representing the nurses. On Wednesday, they filed a temporary restraining order pleading for a judge to step in. The number one purpose is to have a court step in and take this over. Have everyone tested appropriately. Stop all discharges or transfers or admissions until the right procedure is done to figure out how widespread it is. In a statement, Landmark Hospital CEO Marie Saylor wrote 11 Alive, we can assure you that we will vigorously investigate allegations and defend our hospital and its staff against misleading and false claims. The hospital follows CDC state and local guidelines as well as established protocols and procedures for COVID-19 testing. You provide the Multiple nurses still working there disagree. You're lying to your patients, you're lying to the family members, and quite frankly, for a disease that has killed so many people, quit being so careless. Landmark Hospital says it has no current COVID-19 patients it's aware of. Nurses tell me that's not true. A Georgia State University public health expert tells me that it is important to properly test patients to make sure the state has accurate case numbers. He says not doing it intentionally could be unethical and also dangerous. A judge could make a determination on whether to step in in the next few days. We received a statement from the hospital late this evening saying, quote, three employees of Landmark Hospital of Athens were suspended with pay today pending an investigation of the theft of medical records and company property from the hospital. The CEO of the hospital also promised a full investigation to ensure protection of patient privacy. The burden of COVID-19 is not equal. Some communities, particularly those with a large minority population, suffer high infection rates, hospitalizations, and deaths. Emory has a new tool aimed at helping us see those disparities all across the country. The new health equity dashboard is what it's called. It can break things down to a county by county level so you can compare the cases in your county to other places in the state. The percentage of residents who are black information is considered there too so you can see the disparities. You can also see the information on poverty and obesity rates and how many people are uninsured. Researchers say it will be a very important tool as we start to open back Back up even more to see if everyone is getting the health care that they need and where states should focus their resources. There is no one single approach to preventing the spread of COVID-19. We all have to make decisions and do our own part. But as Francesca Amaker reports, one Atlanta resident has made her mission to keep her community healthy and educated, and she's enlisted the help of local artists to do it. With minority groups continuing to be hit the hardest by COVID-19, Sherry Scott of Southwest Atlanta knew she needed to do something to protect the community that she loves. I went to a Kroger. I was one of the few people wearing masks. The cashier was crying because she was really nervous about having to work in a situation where people weren't wearing masks. It became very apparent to me that whatever the messages were about prevention and awareness, they weren't hitting my community. So Big Fat Small Acts launched on May 1st with about 15 community signs and put up all throughout 30310, 30315, the south and, and west side of the city. And then we have some amazing, talented muralists in the city who have agreed to mask their murals for us. It's been amazing to see the power of art. You know, Atlanta, Atlanta is a city known for creativity. In addition to the mask murals and yard signs, Big Facts Small Acts have also launched their social media, making the facts of COVID-19 readily available and easily accessible. Our site is an easy way to get smart about how to protect yourself and your community from COVID and then also really to find resources that can help other people as well. COVID has not gone away. I know people are tired of talking about it. It's continuing to impact our community. Part of the reason why COVID is hitting our community so hard is policy. It's an election year. We need people to be healthy and educated and aware going into November. So as people are out and about protesting, voting, helping each other, it's important that we're smart while we're doing that. We are more powerful together. 
After 18 years, one class ring is going to travel more than 350 miles back to its rightful owner. Last weekend, a man in Jacksonville, Florida, found a Gwinnett County High School class ring on the beach. He wanted to find the rightful owner, so after some research, he called the Gwinnett County Police Department. I answered the phone and the officer was like, hey, I have some weird questions for you. And I was like, okay. He said, well, first, what's your first and last name? I told him. He said, well, where'd you go to high school? I said, Collins Hill. And he said, and when did you graduate? I said, 2001. He said, okay, well, now I can tell you that somebody has found your ring, um, your high school ring, on the beach in Jacksonville, Florida. The Collins Hill alum says she lost the ring during a beach trip 18 years ago and thought she'd never see it again. I'm glad I made her day. I think she cried when I called her, when I told her I found a ring and I sent her pictures. So while she was on the phone with me, she was looking on Jack's Beach Lost and Found and it was her ring. So, you know, I just find it really amazing that that ring sat on the beach for 18 years. And the ring was set to arrive back in Gwinnett County today. The 11 Alive storm trackers have been tracking some strong storms this evening, and now they're making their way in between Social Circle and Athens, headed to the east. So coming up, we'll show you some of the damage they've done, and we'll talk about what you can expect for the first weekend of summer. Live. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. An overnight shooting on Edgewood Avenue is bringing new attention to crime in the area. Police say a man was shot and had to undergo surgery after a fight. People who live in the neighborhood there say crime has been a problem for years and it has prompted a lot of concern. 
Earlier this week, the Sweet Auburn Community Coalition sent this letter to Atlanta police. It says they plan to close Edgewood Avenue tonight and tomorrow from 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. to try and curb crime. They say they still use their own vehicles, barricades, and more than 20 volunteers. Our reporter DJ Williams talked to them about their concerns today. The, the way I feel is that sometimes you have to take matters in your own hand. Now, what does that mean? We're not going to break laws, but we got to do some kind of citizens getting together, neighbors getting together, business owners, and we actually take our block back and letting people know that they got to respect, respect the block. That's the most important thing for us. Right now, the Sweet Auburn Coalition says they have found an ally and council member, Amir Faroki, who has acted as a liaison between the community and APD. And we've learned police have now agreed to close off Edgewood Avenue tonight instead of letting residents do it themselves. For your 11 Alive storm trackers, we're tracking the storms that worked their way across the North Georgia mountains and then worked their way across the East Metro. You can see the convection here in the time lapse. You may also notice that. Uh, bothersome bug that keeps wanting a close up here in the camera. But then you can see a downpour in the distance, and those are those storms that move to the East Metro and then off towards Social Circle and Athens. And as they cross Lake Lanier, look at this incredible picture Tommy Meyer got of a cloud burst right over the lake. Just massive that thunderstorm as it moved on in. Now, none of these were classified as severe, but that is a classic anvil topped thunderstorm, and it was producing 40 mile per hour winds, heavy downpours, and frequent lightning. And it's still producing some lightning as it moves off to the east here. Now it is south of Athens moving towards Washington, but still quite a few lightning strikes at this time in the evening, around 20 in the past 15 minutes alone. So a lot of electricity and still some heavy rain associated with those storms. And as they moved through Monroe, this was very interesting. One of our storm trackers said, hey, we had hail in Monroe. And I searched, and yeah, we did have some pretty good hail near Woodlake Boulevard. Those are the hail tracks. And here's her picture. Linda Oswald took this picture. You can see most of it looks like it is pebble-sized hail. But uh, boy, it kind of covered her patio there for a while, for sure, as that uh, moved in with those thunderstorms. So now we're going to watch those continue to move off to the east and improving conditions behind it. I think after those move out, all is going to be pretty quiet for tonight. So temperatures today hit 87 in Atlanta. That's right where we should be this year. You know, the hottest we've been so far this year is 89. We have yet to have a 90 degree temperature. We'll probably end up seeing it this weekend, though. So we have rain cooled air out there at the moment. It feels pretty good in Clayton 70, Blairsville 68, Gainesville 71, and it's 70 in Covington at the moment and in Eatonton. And overnight tonight, we'll see those temperatures in Atlanta get down into the mid 60s. Lots of sunshine tomorrow and heating up quickly. That's what the difference is going to be. I think you'll notice that we're going to be heating up. So we'll be in the mid 80s by lunchtime and close to 90 degrees as we are getting ready for dinner. So as we take a look at what you can expect with those storms, here they are. They're going to be moving off to the east. This is our future radar modeling showing that those storms are going to be pushing out. And behind that, things should be quieting down as we head into the overnight hours. And then we'll see a hot day on Saturday. There'll be a few showers that try to take hold, try to bubble up. But I think high pressure is going to put the squash on them, and they won't be able to develop into much at all. And then we'll be hot on Father's Day. In fact, that'll likely be uh, right around 91 degrees by the afternoon. And staying hot on Monday, 89, as rain approaches and the humidity really starts to rise. So showers and storms will be tapering off. Temperatures will be on the rise and we will have the hot, a hot longest day of the year. Summer solstice, it's tomorrow. And that means we'll have more daylight than any other day of the year and plenty of time to enjoy 90 degrees during the afternoon with all that sunshine hot on our Father's Day right around 91 and then rain chances will come back at us next week. Frontal system moves through at the beginning of next week and brings in a little cooler air by Wednesday and a chance for thunderstorms each day as well. 
In all the uncertainty of the world and in our city lately, we still know there is so much good happening in our community. And that's why we are still asking you to send the love with us. Maisie Thompson is a perfect example of this, a local portrait artist. And after the first round of Black Lives Matter protests, Maisie wanted to find a way to support black owned businesses, which were damaged. She says she didn't have the money for a donation. So she reached out to 11 Alive asking for names of businesses. Maisie offered to decorate the boards covering broken windows with an inspiring mural. Her first completed piece, seen here, is at Wilburn Sisters Designs on Peachtree Street. She says she's gotten an overwhelmingly positive response so far. Beautiful work. Including from nine-year-old Kaylee, who stopped by to say that she is inspired Inspired by the woman in the mur mural. Maisie is planning on adding to it and continuing it at other businesses as well. Love that. So we are where Atlanta speaks, so keep letting us know about the good things happening around you by using the hashtag SendTheLoveATL. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. A group of faith leaders recently took an extraordinary step to address systemic racism. Last weekend, 15 pastors of a predominantly white congregation in Decatur wrote a letter of confession to acknowledge their church's contributions to racial injustice. Reveal investigator Andy Parati asked them to record as they read the letter so the public can also hear their message. I'm the pastor at the Common Table uh, in Decatur, Georgia. I serve as pastor of Oakhurst Baptist Church. I am the senior pastor of Gentle Spirit 
Christian church. They are clergy of 15 predominantly white congregations from a suburban Atlanta town. The youth pastor at First Baptist Church of Decatur. And they're offering words of repentance, confessing for their church's role of racism in the past. Black lives matter. We name this unequivocal truth. Black lives matter to God. We speak to you as white ordained leaders of Decatur churches that for generations have sought to be faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ. However, our beloved churches have fallen short of our call and commission to live fully into Christ's call because we have embraced the self-serving corruption of systemic racism. Justice! Too many of our Decatur churches were planted in soil tainted with racism. Too many of our Decatur churches harvested the fruit of that racism. And like too many of our predecessors, we who now serve as your shepherds have been too silent, too complicit in those systems because they benefit us. As the prophet Jeremiah writes, we have treated the wound of God's people carelessly saying peace, peace, when there is no, no peace. peace. No justice! No peace! No justice! No, no peace. peace! The recent murders of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd force us to see what our fellow black clergy have long told us, that systemic racism is not only embedded in our city, our state, and our nation, it is also embedded in our churches and in us, your clergy. We have been silent. We will no longer be silent. As white clergy, we must engage in the faithful, ongoing work of dismantling racism, anti-blackness, and white supremacy, beginning with ourselves and our churches. Our posture must be one of humility and decentering. We must listen to and follow the leadership of our black clergy colleagues who have led this work for so long and support their work with our labor and resources. I got a grandfather that marched next to Dr. King in the 60s. Amen. And he was amazing. He would be proud to see us all here. Being anti-racist and pro-justice is not separate from the work of the church. This is the core of the church's work. So we covenant with you to restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. Imagine our churches truly living into God's vision for them. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Black lives matter to God. And they must matter to every one of God's people gathered today in our churches. You can read the entire letter and a list of all the churches and pastors who are part of it. It's posted on our website, 11alive.com. All right, coming up on primetime, new information about the police sick outs affecting the city of Atlanta. We're hearing directly from officers about the actual number of people calling out today. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, 
the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household more people than ever are considering skipping the voting precinct and sending in their ballots by mail. Yep, thanks to COVID-19. But someone asked if it matters how many postage stamps you use on the envelope. So we sent our team to verify. Here's Jason Puckett. Over the past decade, we've seen contradictions about just how much postage you actually have to put on a mail-in ballot. Now, some articles say it's extra stamps. Others say you don't need stamps at all. So what's the truth? Well, to answer that, we went straight to the United States Postal Service. In an email to Verify, they said their official policy is that completed ballots will be delivered to the election office even if they don't have full postage. That's verified. You send a completed ballot, they will send it to the election office. Now, just because you don't have to put stamps on mail-in ballots, you definitely should. The USPS relies on that money, and if you don't pay it, your election office gets the bill. If you're seeing other claims or questions that you'd like us to look into, send us an email. Coming up on Primetime, new information about the officer charged with murdering Rayshard Brooks, what we have learned about his involvement in a previous shooting. A single day surge in Georgia of reported coronavirus cases. We're going to look at the reasons behind the spike and what it can mean moving forward. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. We're going to begin tonight with dozens of Atlanta police officers calling out for a third day in a row. This sick out started when the DA in Fulton County announced charges for two officers in the fatal shooting of Rayshard Brooks one week ago. A lot of you have reached out to us with questions about that, concerned about what this could mean for your family and for the city. Tracy Amick Pierre went straight to the officers and got those answers. And they want to do their job. They just don't want to do it in the city of Atlanta where they're not respected and where they'll be, uh, you know, betrayed. So Vince so, Champion uh, says he's not surprised that Atlanta police officers are calling in sick. The sick out started on Wednesday, immediately after District Attorney Paul Howard announced charges against two police officers in the Rayshard Brooks shooting. Champion says the investigation by GBI, which is the lead investigating agency on this case, could take months, and there's no way for due process to happen so fast. They think, you know, that this, this could be me, and I could be doing my job and next thing I know I'm fired because the mayor doesn't like what she saw and then I'm facing murder charges because the DA didn't like what he saw. During a virtual meeting with the city council today, interim police chief Rodney Bryant says so far the sick outs have not put the city at risk. We are in this COVID period and the call volumes are low. The number of sick outs does not have a dramatic effect on our response. Bryant admits the pending calls for 911 have reached more than 30, but says they are mostly low priority calls. So for now, he says they don't need outside assistance for 911 response. Champion says if they do ask, he's not sure how much help the city of Atlanta would get. But he hopes the city reaches out to its own police officers to find a solution soon. So Champion says when officers fill in from other agencies, there there's a learning curve here. They usually don't know the streets or the community, which can uh, hinder their response. And for two days, we have asked to speak directly with the interim police chief and the mayor about all these sick outs. Once again today, 
we did not receive a response. All right, we'll keep asking. Thanks, Ron. Today, former officer Garrett Rolfe waived his first appearance in Fulton County Court. He faces, as you know, 11 charges, including felony murder for shooting Rayshard Brooks. Joe Henke has the latest. Now, former Atlanta police officer Garrett Rolfe waived his first court appearance and a Fulton County judge denied his bond today as expected in a first appearance for someone facing a felony murder charge. We have now confirmed, though, his attorneys have filed for and scheduled a bond hearing on his behalf where they can make an argument in an attempt to receive bond for Rolfe. Meanwhile, this afternoon in a press conference, we heard from two additional witnesses who sat in the Wendy's drive through last Friday night and watched Rayshard Brooks talking with Rolf and Officer Devin Brosnan and eventually witnessed the shooting of Brooks. The encounter was caught on the officer's police-issued body cameras up until the point Brooks began to struggle with officers while being arrested and is seen on video running away. And as soon as I walk over to where they'd been standing, I noticed two police body cameras on the ground face up with nothing else on the ground. Just the cameras. Maggie Kane's friend Doran Hickey was also with her last Friday, and he says he watched Rolf and Brazen as they stood over Brooks immediately following the shooting. There was a long, lengthy discussion about that scene before there was any CPR. Earlier this week, amongst a list of charges, Fulton County District Attorney Paul Howard charged both officers with a violation of oath of office for not giving Brooks timely medical attention. In a statement sent to 11 Alive, Rolf's attorney claims Rolf gathered himself and immediately called for EMS and performed life-saving measures. Brosnan's attorney previously told 11 Alive he suffered a concussion during the incident as Rolf began to assist Brooks. Video provided to us by GBI and APD show both officers offering aid. And we have confirmed Rolf's bond hearing is scheduled for this upcoming Tuesday at 2 p.m. We'll bring you any updates from that hearing first on 11alive.com. We've learned the Fulton County DA had only just cleared former officer Rolf this past February in another shooting from 2015. Rolf and two other officers were accused of covering up the shooting for failing to mention that they had fired a number of shots into a stolen truck and they hit the driver. According to court records obtained by 11 Alive, Rolf fired three shots into the vehicle. Two other officers fired one shot each and the suspect, Jackie Harris, was hit in the center of his back. Judge Doris Down said from the bench, none of the police put in the report that they shot the man. It wasn't until four and a half years later that District Attorney Paul Howard cleared Rolf and the other officers. The DA took just five days to decide charging Rolf for killing Rayshard Brooks. Right now, a lot of groups are shining a spotlight on the need for police reform across Atlanta and across the country, but numbers show the need hasn't changed much over the past decade. Between 2005 and 2019, more than 12,800 non-federal sworn law enforcement officers were arrested and charged with one or more crimes. And each year, police shoot and kill between 900 and 1,000 people in the United States. That's according to the Police Integrity Research Research group. Those shot are almost four times likelier to be black. Nearly 1,100 COVID-19 cases have been reported in Georgia today. Now it's one of the largest single day increases in the state since the pandemic began. Reveal investigator Andy Parati explains why testing is not the only reason for the spike and who's most at risk. COVID-19 is still a very real threat in Georgia, with average cases increasing over the past 10 days. Where Georgia was Georgia State University epidemiologist Dr. Harry Hyman explains. Um, around the time we started declining as a result of closing down businesses and um, requiring social distancing, we started reopening the state. Local officials, including Governor Kemp, attribute increases to more testing. But that's not the only reason. Our testing has been stable for some time, and what we're seeing is um, a persistent high level of COVID-19 cases as a result of continued community spread. The goal now, Hyman says, is to focus on protecting people who are at high risk. Older people and those with multiple chronic diseases are at higher risk for not only contracting COVID, but having a more serious case requiring hospitalization and being at risk for death as a result of COVID. In fact, long-term care facilities account for 45% of all deaths in Georgia. COVID-19 has had a um, disproportionate impact on communities of color, uh, especially the African-American community. The best strategy to protect those at risk, targeted testing. Uh, it means making sure that there's um, access to 
um, walk up, not just drive through testing uh, in, in neighborhoods, not only across uh, urban areas, but also rural areas of our state. Hundreds of thousands of people taking to the streets all across the country today celebrating Juneteenth. It marks the day in 1865 when the last slaves learned they were free, two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, it's been around for more than a century, but this year it's taken on even greater significance. There is also a growing push to make it a federal holiday. Today in Atlanta, thousands showed up to continue rallying for social justice change as part of the One Race March. Demonstrators gathered at Centennial Olympic Park this morning. They began with prayers, asking lawmakers and civic leaders to do more to end racial violence and advocate for greater equality. The crowd then took off for the state capitol before making their way back to the park. Overnight, a group gathered along Edgewood, at Edgewood Avenue in Atlanta, creating a colorful, powerful message here. Giant letters filling the street proclaiming Black Lives Matter. Similar murals have been painted across the country, inspired by 50-foot-wide yellow letters that appeared on a street near the White House on June 5th. And 11 Alive's Maria Martin shared some of these photographs from Atlanta's Beltline, Black Lives Matter, written in huge letters on the pathway. Along the walls, there are messages of support, including the names of those who have lost their lives because of police brutality. A monument honoring the Confederacy disappeared from Decatur Square today, and more could follow. 11 Alive's Doug Richards takes a look. This painting of the vice president of the Confederacy is among the easily overlooked artifacts of the Confederacy here at the state capitol. His name was Alexander Hamilton Stevens. He was from Crawfordville, Georgia. There's also a bust of him near the state capitol rotunda. There's also a statue of Stevens, one of two representing Georgia in the U.S. Capitol. Stevens was an outspoken white supremacist who spoke in shocking terms about people of color. He basically tried to use a scientific argument to say that the, the black race was inferior and their natural condition was human slavery. Uh, that's simply evil. It's wrong. State Representative Scott Turner has introduced a resolution that would replace the statue of Stevens in the U.S. Capitol, representing Georgia, with a statue of Martin Luther King Jr. Replacing Stevens' likeness, Turner says, is a no-brainer. And it certainly is a poor representation of the people of Georgia. Turner introduced his resolution as prep work was underway for the removal of a monument in Decatur honoring the Confederacy. DeKalb County took down the monument overnight following a court order. Turner's resolution to remove the statue of Alexander Stevens at the U.S. Capitol has bipartisan support. What it doesn't have is a lot of time as the legislative session ticks down to adjournment with just six working days to go. And we are watching those thunderstorms as they continue to move off to the east now with still a lot of lightning and some heavy rain. So coming up, what you can expect for the rest of the night and how the first weekend of summer is going to shape up. All right, Sam, see you in a couple of minutes. And folks, don't forget we are streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. Subscribe and join the conversation in the community section. We've got more 11 Alive news in prime time after the break. Some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. 
Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects. Today is, what is it, Monday, the 20th, and uh, I will be flying out tomorrow at 4.30 p.m., so I'm excited and I'm scared, but uh, most of all, I'm ready to kick some COVID-19 butt. Samantha Sansone has been taking us along on her journey since she left home in April to help a lot of people. She's a pediatric nurse at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta who answered the call to help at the heart of the coronavirus pandemic right in New York City. And now she's coming home. I definitely going into this thought, okay, I'm gonna, you know, work my butt off for two months and then I'm gonna go back and things are gonna be completely back to normal. I need to keep on reminding myself that things are not going to be like they were before coronavirus. So I have one more week until I get to go home. So that's four more shifts. I am packing up the last of my stuff. I'm the last traveler on the unit who has been there since day one. All the people that that's their home unit. Um, they're taking this time off because they were working so, so hard before we got there. And then there's people who have just been working a bunch of overtime because they know, you know, other people have families and stuff and they're very selfless people. I kind of feel selfish. Like I get to go home to my family and my life. Some of these pe people were totally fine until they weren't. Uh, some of these people were in great health. I think we should probably be more careful than we're being, but at the same time, people are wanting their sanity back and uh, wanting to have social events back because that's what makes us human. Every day I FaceTime Brendan and we talk about how we can't wait to see how Cooper reacts when I'm home. Even when I leave for like four hours, he freaks out. I miss them both so much and uh, this was a very hard two months because of that. Home at last. I'm back at my dad. <laughs> so happy. <laughs> hey, dude. <laughs> at the end of the day, um, although I'm so happy to be home, I'm also so grateful that I was able to have this experience and to feel like I impacted the world and people's lives, as well as them impacting mine. Thank you for working so hard and representing Atlanta in New York City, and thanks for sharing your story. We are working hard to bring you context and perspective as Georgia continues trying to flatten the COVID curve. You'll find more on case numbers and trends in Georgia on our special coronavirus section of 11alive.com. Well, we had some strong thunderstorms that rolled across the North Georgia mountains earlier and then made their way through Gwinnett. This is at the end of the day when the sun was setting, but throughout much of the afternoon with the daytime heating and the moisture around, look at the convection that we saw, all that bubbling air here, and that meant lift in the atmosphere. And what we saw were some strong storms moving in across Gwinnett, dropping a lot of heavy rain. There you can see a cloudburst there as well as bringing in a lot of lightning and gusty winds up to around 40 miles per hour. Tommy Meyer out on Lake Lanier taking this picture of an incredible thunderstorm and a downburst with some heavy rain right over the lake. Hopefully everybody was off the lake at the time because we had a lot of lightning with that thunderstorm as well. And still some lightning stretching out uh, east of town, well east along I-20 as that storm moves away from us now. So we're going to see improving conditions once we get into the next half an hour to an hour, even on the east side here, east of Social Circle and out I-20, where we've had a lot of lightning today. Now the lightning strike's starting to calm down. Only three here from Madison over towards Washington, and still some heavy rain there at this hour as it moves to the east. But I think things are going to be quieting down now that the sun has set, and things are going to start cooling off. We had some hail with the storm as it moved through Monroe. In fact, one of our 11 Alive storm trackers posted this picture 
Linda Osbolt uh, in Monroe of just a pile of hail on her back deck after that thunderstorm passed on through. So as we continue to watch it tonight, it's working its way away from Monroe, away from Athens, and off to the east. And behind it, things are looking much much better. So our high today 87, our low 68. We should be around 87 and 69 this time of year and we were well below the record of 99 degrees. That was the record for the date. And temperatures now are rain cooled 68 in Clayton, 67 in Gainesville. Things are feeling so much nicer out there. Still 80 degrees in Atlanta, 76 in the Grange. So as we head in through tomorrow, temperatures are going to warm up really quickly. I think that's the thing you're going to note is by lunchtime we're going to be in the mid 80s and then temperatures topping out most likely near 90 degrees by the afternoon hours. So here's our forecast as we head in through the rest of tonight. There's what's left of the rain moving off to the east. We'll see a lot of sunshine tomorrow, heating up quickly, humidity up as well. So it's going to feel pretty sticky out there. And then the modeling, this is 4 o'clock, trying to bring up a few showers, but I think as high pressure builds in, it's going to sit on top of this and kind of compress anything that tries to form here. And that's going to be the same story on Sunday as well. Even though the modeling is showing some showers, if we see any, they will be short-lived and few and far between. I think the main thing is going to be the heat. So our showers and storms are moving out. Temperatures are going to be on the rise this weekend. And of course, tomorrow's the summer solstice and it is the longest day of the year. So we're going to have plenty of time to get out and enjoy some very nice weather. It'll be hot. It'll be sunny. So do remember to protect your eyes and protect your skin from the sun. 90 degrees should be our high today. 91 on Father's Day. A mostly dry weekend in store. Just a very hot one. And then we'll see a frontal system to move on in a cool front next week it'll be slow to move in but it will end up bringing us a little cooler air by the middle of next week down in the low 80s and then we'll end up seeing an increase in the showers and storms for the middle of the week all right thanks a lot sam you know we want to continue to talk about the history and importance and importance of juneteenth and we're going to be sharing some of those fun facts throughout the show stick around for those We appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
It has been several weeks of upheaval here in Atlanta, demonstrations which turned violent one night following the death of George Floyd. Then the shooting of Rayshard Brooks in the parking lot of a Wendy's restaurant. Two officers have been charged. One, Garrett Rolfe, faces a felony murder charge. Joining me right now is Chuck Todd, moderator of Meet the Press. And Chuck, now even though there has been a lot of discussions about policing and race relations for decades in our country, it just seems like we're at this turning point right now in America. As we look to November, when people get out there to vote, does the president's tweets of law and order and the protests that we're seeing right now do we think that's going to carry over five months from now when we have the election in November? That's a that's an open question. I think if it does, uh, the president's in trouble. You know, one of the patterns we've noticed in his approval ratings or in any of his polling is that whenever he seems to be, uh, it, when we're in one of these uh, moments uh, on race in this country and he seems to insert himself in it or be a part of it, Think Charlottesville, if you will, the both sides comments. Um, his numbers, that's one of the few times you see his numbers will, will plummet. Not a lot, but anywhere from three to five points. And if you look now, over the last month, as this has been so intense, um, and I think the focus where, where you now have a majority of white America seeing what majorities of, of what, what black America has been seeing for decades on the inequality front, is that you're seeing it take a toll on this president. So that's why I say if it does sustain itself, I think I, I don't think this law and order message of the president at all. I think it, it is a it is a message that is I don't think rings is is rings pretty hollow now. I mean look I I grew up in Miami in the seventies and eighties and there was a lot of those messages and they would work at that time. Um, I don't it doesn't feel like that's a message that's gonna resonate as well this cycle. Okay, you, you we're talking about President Trump now. He's heading to Tulsa for that rally tomorrow. And Chuck, uh, is this going to be the same kind of rally that we saw before the pandemic? So what are you looking for tomorrow night? That's the question I have. I mean, I know the president wants it to be right back to where it was. He wants one of those rallies, and, and his staff tells me that they he sort of, he needs this. It's, uh, you know, in the same way you and I were talking earlier about working from our homes for as long in, in his mind this is he's been he's been kept up and he hasn't been able to have one of these moments I, I will say this I think he has expended an awful lot of political capital for a, to hold a rally in a city um, uh, if, for, in a state that he really doesn't need politically and if he does he's in deep trouble nationally he's expended a ton of political capital and I don't know what the upside is other than to make him feel better um, it's caused a lot of strife within Oklahoma Republicans. You've got a city that's unhappy. You've got an African-American community in Tulsa who feels offended by how it was planned out. Um, at first, the rally being on Juneteenth. It's come with nothing but sort of trouble uh, for, for this campaign. So I just think there's an awful lot of risk with this rally for what, I, what appears to me very limited upside. All right, turning out to a political story that's uh, rolling over right now in Georgia. And, and there's going to be a Republican runoff in the 14th Congressional District. Marjorie Taylor Greene was a top vote getter in the primary, but Politico uncovered some videos in which she made some negative comments about blacks, Jews, and yeah. Muslims. So how do national Republicans feel about her? And how worried are they if she wins this uh, very conservative seat? Well, I, I look, they, they've already, the separation's begun. You've seen the unendorsements have come. You've had House leaders uh, try to endorse uh, the other gentleman in the runoff. I, I, look, this is one of those cases where if she's the nominee, um, kind of like if you recall the Congressman Steve King out in Iowa who had some, basically a, a self-proclaimed white nationalist, um, Republicans ended up ousting him in a primary, but he almost lost a very Republican seat two years ago because of those views. Uh, it it puts I, look. I think this is a, a potential disaster for the entire Republican ticket if she's on it in the fall. And the problem they have is is I think there's this nervousness if they come out and it looks like the establishment is like coming in droves trying to drive her out. I think there's some concern that the rank and file voter, particularly for a low turnout runoff you know, they might revolt against the quote-unquote establishment and she gets the nomination. And then you have all sorts of awkward... There are two competitive Senate races in this state. It's a competitive presidential race. 
I can tell you this. I know national Republican leaders would would prefer her not to be on that November ticket. I just don't know how they stop her. Okay, I guess we just have to wait and see. Meet the Press airs Sunday, 10 a.m., right here on 11 Alive. Chuck, as always, thank you, sir. Some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, something. Now to an 11 Alive exclusive investigation. Um, is, this is all connected to COVID-19. We uncovered explosive claims against a hospital accused of creating phony COVID-19 test results. And tonight, Reveal investigator Andy Parati followed up with the hospital about these conditions. <laughs> Your job as a nurse is to be your patient's advocate. We are their only voice. A critical care facility accused of manipulating COVID-19 test results. The allegations made by four nurses in court documents filed against Landmark Hospital in Athens. One former and one current nurse agreed to tell us how the hospital allegedly does it. They've asked us not to identify them by face or name. When they had somebody that turned out positive, they would redo the test so that it would come back negative and they would say that it was a false positive. Once our testing the proper way started coming back positive, we then weren't allowed to collect the samples any longer. These nurses say the hospital instructed staff to take samples from inside someone's throat, but send them to a lab that only tests nasal swabs, knowing the results would turn out negative. When you raise red flags, what was their response? They would deny it. Mm -hmm. Deny, deny, deny. This nurse says when she properly administered a test, 
her boss retaliated. I did the test and it did turn out positive, so I was terminated for not having a doctor's order for a test. And this is multiple, multiple staff members that are raising flags. Natalie Woodward and Brian Cathy are attorneys representing the nurses. On Wednesday, they filed a temporary restraining order pleading for a judge to step in. The number one purpose is to have a court step in and take this over, have everyone tested appropriately, stop all discharges or transfers or admissions until the right procedure is done to figure out how widespread it is. In a statement, Landmark Hospital CEO Marie Saylor wrote 11 Alive, we can assure you that we will vigorously investigate allegations and defend our hospital and its staff against misleading and false claims. The hospital follows CDC, state, and local guidelines, as well as established protocols and procedures for COVID-19 testing. You provide the Multiple nurses still working there disagree. You're lying to your patients, you're lying to the family members, and quite frankly, for a disease that has killed so many people, quit being so careless. Lamarck Hospital says it has no current COVID-19 patients it's aware of. Nurses tell me that's not true. A Georgia State University public health expert tells me that it is important to properly test patients to make sure the state has accurate case numbers. He says not doing it intentionally could be unethical and also dangerous. A judge could make a determination on whether to step in in the next few days. By the way, we received a statement from the hospital late this evening saying, quote, Three employees of the Landmark Hospital of Athens were suspended with pay today pending an investigation of the theft of medical records and company property from the hospital. The CEO of the hospital also promised a full investigation to ensure protection of patient privacy. The burden of COVID-19 is not equal. Some communities, particularly those with a large minority population, suffer rather high infection rates, hospitalizations, and deaths. But Emory has a new tool aimed at helping us see those disparities across the country. It is a tool that they call the New Health Equity Dashboard. It can break things down by a county by county level so you can compare the cases in your county to some other places in the state. You can also see the percentage of residents who are black, information on the poverty and obesity rates, and how many people are uninsured. Res uh, researchers rather say it will be an important tool as we start to open back up to see if everyone is getting the health care they need and where states should be focusing their resources. There is no one approach to preventing the spread of COVID-19. There are suggestions from doctors, wash your hands, wear a mask, social distance, but we each have to make our own personal decisions. As Francesca Amaker reports, one Atlanta resident has made it her mission to try to keep her community healthy, and she's enlisted some local artists to help educate the public about it. With minority groups continuing to be hit the hardest by COVID-19, Sherry Scott of Southwest Atlanta knew she needed to do something to protect the community that she loves. I went to a Kroger. I was one of the few people wearing masks. The cashier was crying because she was really nervous about having to work in a situation where people weren't wearing masks. It became very apparent to me that whatever the messages were about prevention and awareness, they weren't hitting my community. So Big Fat Small Acts launched on May 1st with about 15 community signs and put up all throughout 30310, 30315, the south and, and west side of the city. And then we have some amazing talented muralists in the city who have agreed to mask their murals for us. It's been amazing to see the power of art. You know, Atlanta, Atlanta is a city known for creativity. In addition to the mass murals and yard signs, Big Facts Small Acts have also launched their social media, making the facts of COVID-19 readily available and easily accessible. So our site is an easy way to get smart about how to protect yourself and community from COVID, and then also really to find resources that can help other people as well. COVID has not gone away. I know people are tired of talking about it. It's continuing to impact our community. Part of the reason why COVID is hitting our community so hard is policy. It's an election year. We need people to be healthy and educated and aware going into November. So as people are out and about protesting, voting, helping each other, it's important that we're smart while we're doing that. We are more powerful together. 
After 18 years, one class ring is going to travel more than 350 miles back to his rightful owner. An amazing story here. Last weekend, a man in Jacksonville, Florida, found a Gwinnett County High School class ring on the beach, so he wanted to help find the owner. So after doing some research, he called the Gwinnett County Police Department. I answered the phone and the officer was like, hey, I have some weird questions for you. And I was like, okay. He said, well, first, what's your first and last name? Told him. He said, well, where'd you go to high school? I said, Collins Hill. And he said, and when did you graduate? I said, 2001. He said, okay, well, now I can tell you that somebody has found your ring, um, your high school ring, on the beach in Jacksonville, Florida. Wow, that's amazing. The Collins Hill alum says that she lost the ring during a beach trip 18 years ago and thought she would never see it again. I'm glad I made her day. I think she cried when I called her and I told her I found a ring and I sent her pictures. So while she was on the phone with me, she was looking on Jack's Beach Lost and Found and it was her ring. So, you know, I just find it really amazing that that ring sat on the beach for 18 years. Wow, she should have that ring right now. Your 11 Alive storm trackers tracking some strong thunderstorms. They're working their way away from us right now, but coming up, what you can expect for this weekend with the heat, with the humidity, and when we'll next see the strong storms return. Lynn In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. An overnight shooting on Edgewood Avenue is bringing new attention to crime in that area. Police say a, a man was shot and had to undergo surgery after a fight. And people who live there say that crime has been a huge problem for years and they're really concerned about it. Earlier this week, 
The Sweet Auburn Community Coalition sent a letter to the Atlanta Police Department. It says they plan to close Edgewood Avenue tonight and tomorrow from 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. to try to curb crime there. They say they will use their own vehicles, barricades, and more than 20 volunteers. Our reporter DJ Williams talked to them about their concerns. The way I feel is that sometimes you have to take matters in your own hand. Now, what does that mean? We're not going to break laws, but we got to do some kind of citizens getting together, neighbors getting together, business owners, and we actually take our block back and letting people know that they got to respect, respect the block. That's the most important thing for us. Right now, the Sweet Auburn Coalition says they have found an ally and a council member there who uh, has acted as a liaison between the community and APD. And we've learned police have now agreed to close off Edgewood Avenue tonight instead of letting the residents do it themselves. Well, we had some strong thunderstorms work their way across North Georgia all afternoon and evening, and now they're moving off to the east in Wilkes County, where they're still producing some significant weather with some heavy downpours, some frequent lightning moving towards Washington right now. In fact, at this hour, it's actually intensified a little bit, kind of stretched out from west to east, and we have 35 strikes in the past 15 minutes alone. So it is a loud and rumbling night stretching from Madison over along I-20 to the east and still some heavy downpours to be had as well. Now it's working its way away from our radar in Peachtree City so it doesn't pick up quite the detail uh, as it gets further away. But boy, we picked up some detail earlier with some hail. This is a hail track that moved uh, right along uh, 78 here in Monroe and one of our 11 Alive storm trackers captured this picture, Linda Oswald of hail just piled up on her patio after a cloud burst there. So thank you, Linda, for posting that hail picture, the pellet-sized hail. And we're seeing the rain move away from us at this hour, so improving conditions as we head into the evening. And boy, look at this. This is the time lapse from Gonetta. Those storms just rolled right in with the dark cloud bases and the heavy downpours. And then afterwards, at sunset, things started to shape up nicely. In fact, in Grayson, look at this beautiful rainbow. Deborah Ringer said, it was raining and it was sunny at the same time, so she was able to capture that beautiful double rainbow over that house. Also, over a tree here in Snellville, another bright double rainbow. That was posted by Robin Bates. And then yet another amazing rainbow. This one, the full arch being seen across the horizon in Winder. And that was posted by Christine Wilcox. Thank you, Storm Trackers. Did a great job chronicling these storms today and showing us all the different varieties of weather. We're seeing the storms move away from us right now. And on the back side of this, improving conditions. I think it's going to end up being a very hot and dry weekend ahead. Uh, we're looking at those temperatures today that topped out right where they should be this time of year. 87 degrees was our high temperature in Atlanta, 89 in Rome, and in the Grange it was hot, and we are getting hotter as we head towards the weekend. But right now we can enjoy a little rain-cooled air in some spots, 67 in Gainesville and Clayton, 64 in Blairsville, 71 in Athens, and 68 in Covington right now. Well, it's still 80 in Atlanta. So as we head into Saturday, it'll be hot and mostly dry. So we have a 10 on the wisometer on that scale of 1 to an 11. With 11 being perfect, we will be unseasonally warm, humid, and it will be a very hot first day of summer. So as we head in through the afternoon, temperatures are going to heat up quickly. We should be in the mid-80s by lunchtime and the upper 80s during the afternoon. And I think we'll top out right around 6 o'clock. If we don't see any showers, uh, which the models seem to want to indicate, we may have one or two. If we don't see any, I think we'll top out around 6 o'clock in the afternoon. So there the showers are out there now. They're going to scoot off to the east. We'll start out nice and dry on Saturday. There's some of the showers I was telling you the models are trying to bring in here. But high pressure is going to build in, and that's going to kind of compress everything down, keep things from forming. So I think we're just going to be hot as we head through this weekend. Father's Day, a little hotter still. So we're thinking low 90s as we head into our Father's Day afternoon. And then even into the beginning of next week, uh, rain chances will start going up. It's still hot and humid, 89 degrees on Monday. So the showers taper off, the temperatures rise, and it is going to be a very hot first day of summer. Summer begins on Saturday. We're expecting 90 degrees, 91 on Sunday for Father's Day, and then we'll see a frontal system approach. It'll probably work its way in here by Tuesday, Wednesday. That'll bring us in a little cooler air and return rain with a chance for thunderstorms in the forecast for most of next week. All right, thanks a lot, Sam. A group of faith leaders recently took extraordinary steps to address systemic racism 
Last weekend, 15 pastors from predominantly white congregations in Decatur wrote a letter of confession to acknowledge their church's contributions to racial injustice. Reveal investigator Andy Parati asked them to record the video as they read the letter so the public can hear that message. I'm the pastor at the Common Table uh, in Decatur, Georgia. I serve as pastor of Oakhurst Baptist Church. I am the senior pastor of Gentle Spirit Christian Church. They are clergy of 15 predominantly white congregations from a suburban Atlanta town. The youth pastor at First Baptist Church of Decatur. And they're offering words of repentance, confessing for their church's role of racism in the past. Black Lives Matter. We name this unequivocal truth. Black Lives Matter to God. We speak to you as white ordained leaders of Decatur churches that for generations have sought to be faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ. However, our beloved churches have fallen short of our call and commission to live fully into Christ's call because we have embraced the self-serving corruption of systemic racism. Too many of our Decatur churches were planted in soil tainted with racism. Too many of our Decatur churches harvested the fruit of that racism. And like too many of our predecessors, we who now serve as your shepherds have been too silent, too complicit in those systems because they benefit us. As the prophet Jeremiah writes, we have treated the wound of God's people carelessly saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. No justice, no peace, no justice, no peace. The recent murders of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd force us to see what our fellow black clergy have long told us, that systemic racism is not only embedded in our city, our state, and our nation, it is also embedded in our churches and in us, your clergy. We have been silent. We will no longer be silent. As white clergy, we must engage in the faithful, ongoing work of dismantling racism, anti-blackness, and white supremacy, beginning with ourselves and our churches. Our posture must be one of humility and decentering. We must listen to and follow the leadership of our black clergy colleagues who have led this work for so long and support their work with our labor and resources. I got a grandfather that marched next to Dr. King in the 60s. Amen. And he was amazing. He would be proud to see us all here. Being anti-racist and pro-justice is not separate from the work of the church. This is the core of the church's work. So we covenant with you to restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. Imagine our churches truly living into God's vision for them. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Black lives matter to God. And they must matter to every one of God's people gathered today in our churches. You can read the entire letter and a list of all the churches and pastors who have participated. It's posted on our website, 11alive.com. In all the uncertainty of the world and around our city lately, we still know there are so many good things happening in our community, and we are still asking you to send the love to show us examples of that. This is a great one. Maisie Thompson, a local portrait artist, after the first round of Black Lives Matter protests, she wanted to find a way to support black-owned businesses that were damaged, but she says she didn't have a lot of money for a donation, so she reached out to us here at 11 Alive. She asked for names of businesses, and Macy offered to decorate the boards covering broken windows with an inspiring mural. Her first completed piece is seen here at Wilburn Sisters Designs on Peachtree Street. She says she's gotten an overwhelmingly positive response so far, including from nine-year-old Kaylee, who stopped by to say that she's inspired by the woman in the mural. Maisie is planning on adding to it and continuing it at other businesses as well. We are where Atlanta speaks, so keep letting us know about the great things you see happening around you. Use that hashtag send the love ATL. Reviews extended.
body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut images. Storm still moving around to the east, moving off to the east, I should say, out I-20. But they're moving away from Atlanta right now. So we're expecting a mostly dry, mostly hot first weekend of summer with 90 degrees on Saturday, 91 on Father's Day. And then a frontal system will return slightly cooler temperatures and rain back to the forecast about every day next week. As we head into Father's Day weekend, we want to take a moment to say thank you to the dads and to all the father figures out there who help guide our way in life's ordinary moments, celebrations, and also in the hardest times when you just need someone by your side. These are the stories of those dads. 16 year old Eric Clark's dad, Willie, has been there every moment since Eric was paralyzed from the neck down during a high school football game. He took a long leave of absence from work so that he would not miss a single therapy session. He gives his son his baths, does his hair every day, and changes the bedding there in the hospital. Elisa's dad is always there with optimism and support. She was diagnosed with leukemia two years ago. And one time when Elise was hospitalized, she wasn't eating very well. So Chris made the hour long drive from home to bring a small snow cone maker to her room. And Angel Martinez was really scared when his hair started falling out from chemo. So his dad decided he'd shave his head too. And this is the hug that happened as soon as Angel saw what his dad had done. His fears kind of melted away in that moment. He just felt loved. So on this Father's Day, we are thinking of all of these dads at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, all the fathers and father figures who make a difference in so many lives every day. Ron, I know uh, 
your kids would want me to say Happy Father's Day to you as well. Absolutely, and tell your husband Happy Father's Day as well. And have a great weekend, Cheryl. I will. Hey, we got more news and weather coming up right here Thanks, on the too, ATL. Ron. gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. We're going to begin tonight with dozens of Atlanta police officers calling out for a third day in a row. The call out started after the Fulton County District Attorney announced charges for two officers charged in the deadly shooting of Rayshard Brooks. We talked to the head of police union who says he's not surprised this is happening. They think, you know, that this this could be me and I could be doing my job and next thing I know I'm fired because the mayor doesn't like what she saw and then I'm facing murder charges because the DA didn't like what he saw. So interim police chief Rodney Bryant says so far the sick outs have not put the city at risk. The pending calls for 911 have reached more than 30, but he says they are mostly low priority calls still ahead in about five minutes. A look at how the Richard Brooks case has impacted our city in just one week. New at 10, a community fights back to keep its streets safe from gun violence. Tonight, a section of Edgewood Avenue is expected to be blocked off to traffic. This comes after a string of shootings in less than a week. Natisha Lance is there with us tonight. She's joining us live in Southeast Atlanta. Natisha, now there was a surprise intervention before it really came down to the wire out there tonight. 
Well, Aisha, that was a plan. There was supposed to be a surprise intervention that came out tonight, but as you see, Edgewood is just as busy as any other Friday night. What apparently seems to have happened is APD was supposed to be out here with barricades to help this community out, but apparently they were called to another call and have been delayed in getting out here. Now, this all started because the Sweet Auburn Community Coalition sent an email to APD as well as to our newsroom saying that they were going to take matters into their own hands when it came to safety. They were going to use their own car their own bodies between the hours of 9 p.m. and 3 a.m. to shut down the street, essentially. But that hasn't happened, so they called on APD, and in the last hours, the final hours, APD said they were going to handle it. We were all very relieved. None of us that were, were volunteering tonight wanted to actually go out and like put ourselves, our bodies at risk. Our, we're going to use our own cars. We're going to use our own bodies, our own safety vests we bought on Amazon. We were prepared to go out and do it if it meant endangering ourselves, but we knew we, we could not have one more repeat of what happened on this past this past weekend. Now, last weekend, police say at least 12, at least five people were shot near Edgewood. It was the final straw for neighbors and business owners in the area, which is known for its popular nightlife. Now, 20 volunteers, in addition to APD that is expected to be out here, 20 volunteers are going to be out here tonight recording what they see, the good and the bad, and they're going to take those videos to a meeting that they have with their city council member on Monday to try to come up with a long-term plan for safety on Edgewood. Guys? All right, Natisha, thank you. So in that same area, a group gathered along Edgewood Avenue overnight to create this colorful, powerful message. It reads Black Lives Matter. Similar murals have been painted all across the country, inspired by 50 foot wide yellow letters that appeared on a street near the White House back on June 5th. Today, former officer Garrett Rolf waived his first appearance in court today in Fulton County, and he faces 11 charges, including felony murder for shooting Rayshard Brooks. A judge denied his bond as expected for a defendant facing a felony murder charge. However, his attorneys have filed for and scheduled a bond hearing. They can make an argument on his behalf in an attempt for him to receive bond. The Fulton County DA had only just cleared former officer Rolf this past February in another shooting from 2015. Rolf and two other officers were accused of covering up the shooting for failing to mention they fired multiple shots into a stolen truck hitting the driver. According to court records obtained by 11 Alive, Rolf fired three shots into the vehicle. Two other officers fired one each and the suspect, Jackie Harris, was hit in the center of his back. Harris did survive. Judge Doris Down said from the bench, none of the police put in the report that they shot the man. It wasn't until four and a half years later that District Attorney Paul Howard cleared Rolf and the other officers. The DA took just five days to decide to charge Rolf for killing Rayshard Brooks. As we mentioned before, it has been exactly one week since two Atlanta police officers were engaging and seemingly cordial at first with a man whose name would we all soon would know as Rayshard Brooks. Well, that encounter ended in a deadly shooting and put Atlanta sadly squarely in the center of the nationwide unrest and the impatient demands for racial justice and police reforms. Here's John Sherrick. What a year this past week has been, again, for our city, our nation. Mr. Brooks. How you doing? Hey, I'm Officer Rolf of the Atlanta Police Department. How you doing? I'm doing this fine. Because of what we all saw happen on Friday, June 12th, at a Wendy's drive through on Atlanta's University Avenue, two white Atlanta police officers trying to arrest a black man they suspected was DUI. He resisted, fought, grabbed an officer's taser, ran away, and appeared on videos to shoot the taser at an officer who was running after him. And the officer shot him in the back and killed him. Saturday began in angry but peaceful protests. Say his name, people chatted. Another name for a long list of officer-involved fatal arrests of African Americans. We learned his name was Rayshard Brooks. We learned he was married, 27 years old, father of three young girls. And later we learned he had a criminal record that he'd been trying to put behind him. And a filmmaker just happened to interview him back in February. If you do some things that's wrong, you pay your debts to society. And that's the bottom line. Within 20 
24 hours after Brooks was killed. Chief Eric Cashill. Atlanta's mayor had accepted the police chief's resignation, and the peaceful protests over the shooting were pushed aside by rioters who set fire to the Wendy's, commandeer the nearby downtown connector. Marchers demanded swift justice for Rayshard Brooks, and the DA, Paul Howard, bypassed the GBI investigation and fast-tracked his own, quickly filing multiple charges against the two officers, including felony murder against the shooter who just been fired, Garrett Rolf, and aggravated assault against the other officer on the scene, Devin Brosnan. Their attorneys saying the videos would prove the officers responded appropriately by the book. We are not answering 911 calls right now due to personnel issues. Atlanta police rank and file angry, morale at an all-time low, catching blue flu, calling in sick, Rayshard Brooks' widow, Tamika Miller, sick to tears. And it hurt. It hurt really bad. When will this all end, she asked, and get better? for everyone. Next week, Rayshard Brooks' funeral and possible votes in the legislature on a hate crimes bill and more marches for racial healing and police reforms in Atlanta. New tonight, the community is coming together to help Rayshard Brooks' widow. Pinky Cole, the owner of Atlanta Restaurant Slutty Vegan, and Derek Hayes, owner of Big Dave Cheesesteaks, gifted Tamika Miller with a new car. Cole and Hayes presented the Ford Escape to Miller today at the lawyer's law firm. Just coming into the newsroom, the hate crimes bail being considered by Georgia lawmakers could face a lot more opposition here. Republicans in uh, Georgia State Senate have now added police as a protected class to proposed hate crimes legislation. So that could really complicate the chance of this bill actually passing. Democrats oppose the move, saying added protections for law enforcement were not appropriate. There are just seven days left in the legislation session to get this bill passed. When that police have arrested the man accused of killing three homeless people in Atlanta, 29 year old David Lee was arrested this morning in the parking lot of the Office Depot on Holcomb Bridge Road. He's accused of killing Timothy Smith, Curtis Cockrell and Maxine McDonald earlier this month in Atlanta. We're told the victims were found shot to death at three different locations dating back to June 1st. Jonesboro police have arrested a woman accused of shooting and killing another woman outside the Waffle House on Terra Boulevard today. Police say this woman, Jasmine Kirk, walked up to the victim who was waiting for an order in her car and shot the woman. She then took off in her car. The victim's name has not been released. And more problems for the DeKalb County Elections Office. They announced today that one of their elections workers has tested positive for COVID-19. They're now asking the Secretary of State's office to postpone certifying the county's results for the June 9th primary. They were supposed to be done by today. Elections officials say the temporary workers first day was June 11th after the primary election. You know, there's a lot of growing concern tonight before President Trump's first campaign rally in months. Thousands of people are traveling to Tulsa, Oklahoma for this event a city that's already dealing with a high number of COVID-19 cases. The campaign is requiring temperature checks for everyone entering the arena, providing hand sanitizers and masks. You don't have to be a rocket science to know that this rally puts us at risk. By the way, the rally was originally planned for tonight, Juneteenth, but rescheduled after pushback from across the country. The Tulsa mayor declared a civil emergency ahead of the rally. The National Guard has been called in for the next couple of nights uh, with a curfew for downtown. Today is Juneteenth, commemorating June 19th, 1865, the day enslaved people in Texas were told they were free. Now that came two years after the Emancipation Proclamation signed by President Lincoln. Hundreds of people celebrated the landmark event today in Atlanta and all across the country. But here at home, photojournalist Pete Smith has sights and sounds of Juneteenth. So Juneteenth is literally, is not the day that, that black people were made free. It was actually the day that all black people collectively, two years later, found out that they were free. Sign, sign, sign. The wonders, wonders, wonders. The walls are coming down. Right now, a lot of people are being, you know, awoke to this holiday, and I hope they will stay awoke to this holiday because it means so much to us as a people. So Juneteenth just really represents an awakening, um, a time of us just really coming into the knowing of our freedom. I think the entire world is starting to realize the importance of Juneteenth in its historical context.
I believe that Juneteenth is our African American people's um, Independence Day. All right, straight ahead, less people are packing their bags and taking to the skies after the break. Just how hard COVID-19 is hitting the travel industry. Here, Eleven Alive Storm Trackers tracking some strong storms today. Now they're really working their way away from the Atlanta area, but they're still pretty powerful for this time of night. So coming up, what can you expect on this first weekend of summer and when we can expect to see more organized rain moving right back in again? And we want to continue to talk about the history and importance of Juneteenth. We'll be right back sharing some facts. Take a look at one now. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough. New at 10, nearly 1,100 new COVID 19 cases reported in Georgia today, sending our numbers up. Again, we are tracking cases across the metro and tonight a look at some of the top zip codes where the virus is growing across our largest counties. Gwinnett County, which is where the virus is growing significantly, had the highest number of COVID-19 cases in the Lawrenceville area with 770. In Fulton, the top zip code is 30331 with 401 total confirmed cases. That includes Princeton Lakes and Greenbrier neighborhoods. Cobb's highest concentration of the virus is Marietta. There are now 450 reported cases there. DeKalb's most recent numbers show the area around Brickhaven, Shambly, and Druid Hills is not reporting 358 cases of COVID-19. Well, I'll tell you what, America's travel industry is among the hardest hit during this pandemic with people staying home a whole lot more. The industry is suffering from massive revenue and job loss. Elwin Lopez explains. I had to cancel a good amount, about 60 clients. DV Barnes is a hairstylist. She travels to Atlanta from Miami once a month, but for four months now, her domestic trips are less frequent. I haven't been able to do that since uh, February. She's not alone. Research for the U.S. Travel Association shows domestic trips taken by U.S. residents are expected to fall 30% from last year. The last time we saw that was in 1991. It is really devastating for our industry, but also for the broader economy. Tori Emerson Barnes with the U.S. Travel Association says stimulus measures need to be implemented and soon. Our projections are that 
if this is nine times worse than 9-11 from an economic standpoint. And a lot of folks don't think we'll see a recovery until 2023, 2024. DV says just last month as she flew into Atlanta, home to the world's busiest airport, she noticed the impact at Hartsville-Jackson. About 90% of the stores were closed. Everybody wore masks. It was kind of like tense. The U.S. Travel Association says total travel spending is predicted to drop 45% by the end of the year. As for international inbound spending, that's expected to fall 75%. We want um, health and safety to be first and foremost, um, but we also want folks to be able to get back out there and travel safely. I want to give a big shout out to all of our storm trackers today who did a great job chronicling those storms as they worked their way across North Georgia and then off to the east. One of our storm trackers, Tommy Meyer, over Lake Lanier had his drone up. And look at this cumulonimbus cloud that he captured, this thunderstorm. There's the rain cooled air and the rain pouring out the bottom. Just an incredible uh, picture of that storm. Thank you so much, Tommy, for posting that on our 11 Alive Storm Tracker Facebook page. And you can see where those storms are now. They're working their way off to the east, right out I 20 into Augusta, where they were producing some severe weather just a short while ago. That warning has since expired, but we're still seeing some heavy rain and a lot of lightning off to our east. It is out of the metro now, but still a lot of lightning for this time of night. 26, 26 strikes in the past 15 minutes, most of it over Augusta at this hour. So as it moved through, it did produce some very heavy downpours, wind gusts up to 40 miles per hour, as well as frequent cloud to ground lightning and some hail. This is the hail track that moved through, and I first saw it when one of our storm trackers posted this. Linda, storm tracker Linda Oswald, posted this picture of hail on her back deck, just a downburst of hail, and that little uh, pea-sized hail is what was uh, piling up on her deck as that storm moved through Monroe. So now you can see things are going to be improving behind that storm system as we're going to end up seeing improving conditions overnight. This is uh, what we saw during the day from time lapse, actually late afternoon, evening, the last three hours of time lapse, showing those clouds darken in Gwinnett as it moved on through and then we ended up seeing the sunset and uh, improving conditions across Gwinnett County. So uh, things are going to be looking good. It's going to be looking hot, but it's going to be looking nice for tomorrow. 87 our high, 68 our low. That's pretty much where we should be this time of year, uh, right around 87 and 69 for a high and a low temperature. And temps right now have cooled off. Mid-60s in Gainesville, mid-60s in Clayton, 68 in Covington, 68 in Eatonton, 77 right now in the center of Atlanta. So we're looking at those temperatures overnight, getting into the mid-60s. And then tomorrow, we are going to be heating up quickly. A 10 on your wasometer on that scale of 1 to an 11, with 11 being a perfect day. A 10 with temperatures getting up into uh, upper 80s to near 90 degrees. So it could end up being our first 90 degree day of the year. I think we'll be in the mid 80s by lunchtime and we'll be approaching 90 by around dinner time. So that area of cloud cover and the rain moving away from us tomorrow, we're going to be uh, dry throughout the day. The models keep trying to bring a few showers in here, so I wouldn't be surprised if we get a few little pop-ups. They're not going to amount to much. They're not going to last long. Nothing like what we saw today. And then the same thing on Sunday. I think high pressure building in is going to keep us, for the most part, mostly dry and hot. So the showers are moving out, the temperatures are warming up, and tomorrow is the longest day of the year. That's right, it's the summer solstice, and that means we're going to end up seeing things really start to warm up, and we're going to end up seeing things even warmer for Father's Day. So on the first day of summer, 90 degrees for Father's Day, 91, and then a frontal system moves in next week. We'll be cooling us off and bringing back more showers and thunderstorms, especially Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Hey, your weather wow moment tonight is a big one. Check this out. A lightning strike caught on camera earlier this week in Lubbock, Texas. The strike looks like a tree. It was captured by Kyle Allen. Uh, Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb, he posted on his Facebook page yesterday, and it has gotten a lot of attention. We want to see your weather wow moments, and the easiest way to share them is on our 11 Alive Storm Tracker Facebook page. Go to that group right now, sign up, and hopefully we'll see your work right here on WATL and 11 Alive. A Gwinnett High School class ring found almost 20 years after being lost hundreds of miles away. How one gets a merit and work to return it to its owner.
We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Prime Time, weeknights from 8 to 11. After 18 years, One Class Ring is going to travel more than 350 miles back to its rightful owner. So last weekend, a man in Jacksonville, Florida, found a Gwinnett County High School class ring on the beach. He wanted to find the owner, so after doing some research, he called the Gwinnett County Police Department. I answered the phone and the officer was like, hey, I have some weird questions for you. And I was like, okay. He said, well, first, what's your first and last name? I told him. He said, well, where'd you go to high school? I said, Collins Hill. And he said, and when did you graduate? I said, 2001. He said, okay, well, now I can tell you that somebody has found your ring, um, your high school ring, on the beach in Jacksonville, Florida. The Collins Hill alum says she lost the ring during a beach trip 18 years ago and thought she'd never see it again. I'm glad I made her day. I think she cried when I called her when I told her I found a ring and I sent her pictures. So while she was on the phone with me, she was looking on Jack's Beach Lost and Found and it was her ring. So you know, I just find it really amazing that that ring sat on the beach for 18 years. So the ring was actually expected to arrive at Amy's home today. Ron is so miraculous and I just love technology that he was able to track her down after all this time. Class I rings are special. 18 years and she probably, just like you said, probably thought she would never ever see it again. That's right. Well, you're going to see me coming up, Ron, in about 35 okay. minutes. Time for me to head out to get ready for up late. I'll see you on 11 Alive at 11. I will see you then. Thanks a lot, Aisha. Here's what's coming up right here on the ATL. A Confederate monument was taken down in Decatur overnight. After the break, we're going to look at which monuments could be next. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you. We hear you. 
and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message. One Confederate monument came down in Decatur today, and it may not be the last. A bill in the legislature targets a statue honoring Georgia in the U.S. Capitol. 11 Alive's Doug Richards takes a closer look. The monument honoring the Confederacy has been a sore spot for years in central DeKalb County. County workers took it down overnight with the blessing of a DeKalb Superior Court judge and a late night crowd of buoyant spectators. Once the sun came up, the crowd reformed to bid the monument good riddance, led by DeKalb CEO Michael Thurmond. The statute is gone, but racism still remains. The monument removed overnight leaves behind dozens of other Confederate markers in Georgia, many of them at the state capitol. One Confederate figure honored with both a painting and a bust is the Confederacy's Vice President, Alexander Stevens. Stevens also has a statue representing Georgia in the U.S. Capitol. He basically tried to use a scientific argument to say that the, the black race was inferior. Republican State Rep Scott Turner wants the Stevens statue in the U.S. Capitol taken down and replaced with a statue of Martin Luther King Jr. Once it came to my uh, attention that this was a situation, it was a slam dunk no-brainer. Turner's resolution mimics other calls to remove vestiges of the Confederacy, from the granite face of Stone Mountain Park to the obelisk in Decatur. The Georgia legislature recently enacted a law to actually protect such monuments. Senator Jeff Mullis wrote it. The way I feel about monuments and memorials is that they should remain because it's part of our history. Good, bad, or indifference is part of our history. It's who we are. 
Turner's resolution to remove the statue of Stevens from the U.S. Capitol has bipartisan support. What it lacks is time. The legislature will adjourn in six working days. His resolution has not emerged as a priority. All right, Doug, thanks a lot. Now to an 11 Alive exclusive investigation connected to COVID-19. We have uncovered explosive claims against a hospital accused of creating phony COVID-19 test results. And tonight, Reveal investigator Andy Parati follows up with the hospital about these accusations. Your job as a nurse is to be your patient's advocate. We are their only voice. A critical care facility accused of manipulating COVID-19 test results. The allegations made by four nurses in court documents filed against Landmark Hospital in Athens. One former and one current nurse agreed to tell us how the hospital allegedly does it. They've asked us not to identify them by face or name. When they had somebody that turned out positive, they would redo the test so that it would come back negative and they would say that it was a false positive. Once our testing the proper way started coming back positive, we then weren't allowed to collect the samples any longer. These nurses say the hospital instructed staff to take samples from inside someone's throat, but send them to a lab that only tests nasal swabs, knowing the results would turn out negative. When you raise red flags, what was their response? They would deny it. Mm -hmm. Deny, deny, deny. This nurse says when she properly administered a test, her boss retaliated. I did the test and it did turn out positive, so I was terminated for not having a doctor's order for a test. This is multiple, multiple staff members that are raising flags. Natalie Woodward and Brian Cathy are attorneys representing the nurses. On Wednesday, they filed a temporary restraining order pleading for a judge to step in. The number one purpose is to have a court step in and take this over. Have everyone tested appropriately. Stop all discharges or transfers or admissions until the right procedure is done to figure out how widespread it is. In a statement, Landmark Hospital CEO Marie Saylor wrote 11 Alive, we can assure you that we will vigorously investigate allegations and defend our hospital and its staff against misleading and false claims. The hospital follows CDC state and local guidelines, as well as established protocols and procedures for COVID-19 testing. You provide the Multiple nurses still working there disagree. You're lying to your patients, you're lying to the family members, and quite frankly, for a disease that has killed so many people, quit being so careless. Landmark Hospital says it has no current COVID-19 patients it's aware of. Nurses tell me that's not true. A Georgia State University public health expert tells me that it is important to properly test patients to make sure the state has accurate case numbers. He says not doing it intentionally could be unethical and also dangerous. A judge could make a determination on whether to step in in the next few days. You know, the burden of COVID-19 is not equal. Some communities, especially those with uh, the large minority population, suffer from high infection rates, hospitalizations, and deaths. Emory has a brand new tool aimed at helping us see those disparities across the country. The new health equity uh, dashboard can break things down by county by county, right to that level so you can compare the cases in your county to other places in the state. You can also see the percentage of residents who are black, information on the poverty and obesity rates, and how many people are uninsured. Researchers say it will be an important tool as we start to open back up the state and see if everyone is getting the health care they deserve and need and where states should focus their resources. Today is is it Monday the 20th and uh, I will be flying out tomorrow at 4 30 p.m. so I'm excited and I'm scared but uh, most of all I'm ready to kick some COVID-19 butt. Yeah there you go Samantha Sansone uh, has been taking us along her journey since she left home in April to help out and she's a pediatric nurse at Children's Healthcare in Atlanta who answered the call to help at the heart of the coronavirus pandemic New York City and now she's coming home. I definitely going into this thought, okay, I'm gonna, you know, work my butt off for two months and then I'm gonna go back and things are gonna be completely back to normal. 
I need to keep on reminding myself that things are not gonna be like they were before coronavirus. one more week until I get to go home. So that's four more shifts. I am packing up the last of my stuff. I'm the last traveler on the unit who has been there since day one. All the people that that's their home unit, um, they're taking this time off because they were working so, so hard before we got there. And then there's people who have just been working a bunch of overtime because they know, you know, other people have families and stuff and they're very selfless people. I kind of feel selfish. Like, I get to go home to my family and my life. Some of these pe people were totally fine until they weren't. Uh, some of these people were in great health. I think we should probably be more careful than we're being, but at the same time, people are wanting their sanity back and uh, wanting to have social events back because that's what makes us human. Every day, I FaceTime Brendan and we talk about how we can't wait to see how Cooper reacts when I'm home. Even when I leave for like four hours, he freaks out. I miss them both so much. And uh, this was a very hard two months because of that. Home at last. I'm back with my dad. So happy. <laughs> hey, dude. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, um, although I'm so happy to be home, I'm also so grateful that I was able to have this experience and to feel like I impacted the world and people's lives, as well as them impacting mine. Well, as you know, there's no one approach to preventing the spread of COVID-19. We all have to do our part. As Francesca Amaker reports, one Atlanta resident has made it her mission to keep her community healthy and educated by recruiting local artists. With minority groups continuing to be hit the hardest by COVID-19, Sherry Scott of Southwest Atlanta knew she needed to do something to protect the community that she loves. I went to a Kroger. I was one of the few people wearing masks. The cashier was crying because she was really nervous about having to work in a situation where people weren't wearing masks. It became very apparent to me that whatever the messages were about prevention and awareness, they weren't hitting my community. So Big Fat Small Acts launched on May 1st with about 15 community signs and put up all throughout 30310, 30315, the south and, and west side of the city. And then we have some amazing talented muralists in the city who have agreed to mask their murals for us. It's been amazing to see the power of art. You know, Atlanta, Atlanta is a city known for creativity. In addition to the mask murals and yard signs, Big Facts Small Acts have also launched their social media, making the facts of COVID-19 readily available and easily accessible. Our site is an easy way to get smart about how to protect yourself and your community from COVID and then also really to find resources that can help other people as well. COVID has not gone away. I know people are tired of talking about it. It's continuing to impact our community. Part of the reason why COVID is hitting our community so hard is policy. It's an election year. We need people to be healthy and educated and aware going into November. So as people are out and about protesting, voting, helping each other, it's important that we're smart while we're doing that. We are more powerful together. For your 11 Alive storm trackers, we're busy today tracking thunderstorms that rumbled across North Georgia and now working their way out 20, where they're pretty feisty for this time of night. So coming up, what you can expect for this first weekend of summer and when you can next expect the storms to make a return. See you in a couple of minutes, Sam. Next in sports, Atlanta Dream player Renee Montgomery, who is uh, stepping away from basketball to help with social justice reform, is already taking action in the community. We're going to hear from her next. Watching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. 
For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Several weeks of upheaval here in Atlanta, demonstrations which turned violent one night following the death of George Floyd. Then the shooting of Rayshard Brooks in the parking lot of a Wendy's restaurant. Two officers have been charged. One, Garrett Rolfe, faces a felony murder charge. Joining me right now is Chuck Todd, moderator of Meet the Press. And Chuck, now even though there has been a lot of discussions about policing and race relations for decades in our country, it just seems like we're at this turning point right now in America. As we look to November, when people get out there to vote, does the president's tweets of law and order and the protests that we're seeing right now do we think that's going to carry over five months from now when we have the election in November? That's a that's an open question. I think if it does, uh, the president's in trouble. You know, one of the patterns we've noticed in his approval ratings or in any of his polling is that whenever he seems to be, uh, it, when we're in one of these uh, moments uh, on race in this country and he seems to insert himself in it or be a part of it, Think Charlottesville, if you will, the both sides comments. Um, his numbers, that's one of the few times you see his numbers will, will plummet. Not a lot, but anywhere from three to five points. That's why I say if it does sustain itself, I think I, I don't think this law and order message of the president at all. I think it, it is a it doesn't feel like that's a message that's going to resonate as well this cycle. 
and there's going to be a Republican runoff in the 14th Congressional District. Marjorie Taylor Greene was a top vote getter in the primary, but Politico uncovered some videos in which she made some negative comments about blacks, Jews, yeah. and Muslims. So how do national Republicans feel about her, and how worried are they if she wins this uh, very conservative seat? I think this is a, a potential disaster for the entire Republican ticket if she's on it in the fall. And the problem they have is, is I think there's this nervousness if they come out and it looks like the establishment is like coming in droves trying to drive her out, I think there's some concern that the rank and file voter, particularly for a low turnout runoff, you know, they might revolt against the quote unquote establishment and she gets the nomination. And then you have all sorts of awkward, there are two competitive Senate races in this state. It's a competitive presidential race. I can tell you this, I know national Republican leaders would, would prefer her not to be on that November ticket. I just don't know how they stop her. Okay, I guess we just have to wait and see. Meet the Press airs Sunday, 10 a.m., right here on 11 Alive. Chuck, as always, thank you, sir. We are 11 Alive storm trackers are watching those thunderstorms rumble across North Georgia, across Lake Lanier, through Gwinnett, and now working their way out I-20, where for this time of night, they're still pretty frisky over the Augusta area with a lot of lightning and still some pretty heavy downpours. Uh, they are moving away from the city of Atlanta, though, so no worries here in town. But for those folks who live way out I-20 uh, towards Augusta, still some thundering going on with a lot of this lightning associated with these storms. But as they moved through uh, closer into the Athens area, we had some reports of hail. Then we started to see the clouds part, and we had incredible incredible rainbows uh, showing up on our Storm Tracker Facebook page. Deborah Ringer uh, showing us these pictures from Grayson. She said it was raining and sunny at the same time, and so she was able to catch this double rainbow. There were a lot of double rainbows out there. This one in Snellville from Robin Bates. She posted this one over the tree line, and then this is the most perfect one here, I have to say. Christine Wilcox and Winder uh, capturing this double rainbow as well. Just a beautiful arc over the fields there in Winder. So we're seeing improving conditions as the rain moves away from us, and we will be heating up as we head into this first weekend of summer, which of course is also Father's Day weekend. So summer heat arrives just at the perfect time, right, with the summer solstice, the longest day of the year, the most hours of heating, and we'll likely see that first 90 degree temp. We think so anyway. Today we were close, 87, but it was 91 in Athens, 89 in Rome, and 89 in the Grange. And you know, compare this to last year. Last year we had 91, by the end of the year, 91 90 degree or hotter days. And an average is 37. So we uh, did two and a half times what we would see in an average year. And as of this date last year, we had had 13 90 degree days. So far we have had none. The hottest we've been is 89. That was back on June 4th. So I think this weekend we will likely hit it. If we don't, next week we're cooling down. So it may be a while, but at the, most, of the, most folks don't mind waiting for that first 90 degree day. But we are forecasting 90 for tomorrow, 91 for Sunday. And right now it looks mostly dry, although some of the models are trying to introduce a chance for a few showers out there. So the showers that are out there now are moving away from us as we head into Saturday. We'll see those temperatures warming up quickly during the day. And this is what I mean. The models are trying Trying to show just a couple little spotty showers popping up. I don't think we're going to see anything measurable at all because high pressure is going to be building in. That's going to be heating us up and it also causes the air to sink and it makes the atmosphere more stable. So as we head into Monday, those temperatures continue to heat up here, even though we're going to see some rain moving in. I think we'll be close to 90 on Monday as well. So temperatures are on the rise and it will be the longest day of the year tomorrow with the summer solstice. So we'll end up seeing those temperatures continue to rise as we head into the weekend, we should have our first 90 degree day and then rain returns with cooler air next week. All right, thanks a lot, Sam. Some sports have uh, been able to return since the beginning of the pandemic. We'll talk about NASCAR, the PGA Tour, soccer overseas. And next month, the NBA and MLS were, will return as well. Today, however, it was announced that the first PGA Tour player has tested positive for COVID-19. And today it was also announced that the Phillies had to shut down the team's training facility in Clearwater, Florida, after eight people tested positive. Three were staff members. The Blue Jays have also shut down their Florida facility because of a positive test. 
And for college football, 28 Clemson athletes tested positive for COVID-19 today. 23 of those were uh, football players. The school said most cases have been asymptomatic. Yesterday, we learned that Atlanta Dream Guard uh, Renee Montgomery would be sitting out for the 2020 season to focus on sh social justice reform. And today, she helped organize a Juneteenth event at Centennial Olympic Park to help get the ball rolling, so to speak, with her new nonprofit organization. I took a leap of faith. I didn't have like a specific plan. I just kind of knew that this is where my heart is. So let's see where it goes. And since then, it's been crazy. I just know that I want to create a change. So if there's businesses, other companies, other foundations doing things, then I want to be a part of it. Like, I want to be a part of wherever this movement is going because it's going somewhere good. So I want to be on, I want to be with it. She has set up a GoFundMe page to raise money for feeding and hydrating protesters in Atlanta. Montgomery has been handing out water and supplies herself at different protests around the city. For the first time in league history, the NBA is now giving their employees paid time off for Juneteenth. The league wants employees to use the day as a moment of education and reflection. Several NBA coaches and players are speaking out today, including Hawks head coach Lloyd Pierce and Atlanta native Malcolm Brogdon. We are in this fight together and we are committed to this fight and it's a, it's a fight that will be sustainable by the NBA, by the Coaches Association, by the players, by the media. That is our greatest challenge right now is to take advantage of this opportunity with our platform to address something that has been looked over for, for far too long. I encourage people to educate themselves because the more you educate yourself, the more you are inclined to make an impact, the more you are inclined to take action. You know, more bans on the Confederate flag are coming to college sporting events today. The NCAA announced that no championships will be held in states that have the Confederate symbol shown prominently. Now, this only affects the state of Mississippi, and the announcement comes after the SEC Commissioner Greg Sankey called to action of changing the state flag. That's all we have for sports right now, folks. We'll be right back. Live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. 
We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Well, we're taking a look at your weekend forecast. The showers are moving out of here. We'll have a mostly dry weekend. It'll be hot and humid for the first day of summer. Temperatures near 90 degrees on Saturday. That's the summer solstice. Father's Day, we're talking low 90s. So you need to find something to do with Dad where you can keep your cool. And then it looks like a frontal system will be moving in next week. And that'll bring in some cooler temperatures and a chance for showers and thunderstorms just about every day next week. Summer on the doorstep. Thanks a lot, Sam. Thanks for watching 11 Alive Primetime. Switch over to 11 Alive now for Uplate. To emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear on 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. 